welcome to the Parliament for the World's Religions. We are here live in Salt Lake City, Utah. I am Dr. Daryl Lezell, the Director for the Interfaith Action Program, and I'm with one of our students, Katie Gordon. How are you doing today? I'm great. Wonderful. Katie, could you tell us about your experience in the Interfaith Action Program? Yeah. So I am currently starting my fifth and final term, so I'm finishing the program this December, working on my capstone right now. And I've had a great time in the coursework so mm. far. So I started October 2014, yeah. um, and right from the start, our first two classes were Mindfulness, which is a part of the Claremont Core, right. and Power and Privilege in mm. Self and Society, which is a part of the Interfaith Action Track. Right. And even standalone, those classes were incredible, but put together, mm. um, they really, I think, encapsulated what the CLU experience is supposed to be, which right. is self-analytical, but in a context that is larger than yourself. Absolutely. So yeah, I've enjoyed all of the courses. Really, um, they've all really furthered my interfaith leadership skills. Well, we were just thinking about interfaith leadership skills earlier. We were talking about that. Um, how important is mm -hmm. it today that interfaith practitioners, interfaith leaders receive uh, skills building training or right. training? And yeah. Well, it's funny. So this morning on my way to the parliament, I yeah. stopped by, grabbed coffee, and saw the cover of Salt Lake City Tribune and it said yeah. interfaith love fest happening in Salt Lake okay, City. Okay, okay. Which yeah, it's great that we're here at the parliament. Yeah. We all love each other. It's yeah. a love fest, but we're also talking about how can we engage right. and actually do something with right. this love that we have for mm -hmm, each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think that's where interfaith leadership skills fit in. Right. Um, yeah, I mean they're essential because you have to know how to engage across difference mm -hmm. and that's what I view as what CLU's interfaith action program does right. and what interfaith broadly does right. is teaching the skills for people to to function yeah. in this pluralist, yeah. diverse society. And that's exactly what interfaith action is all about. It's an emerging skill set. In a real sense, I like to say that it's a new field of study. Mm -hmm. And it's not limited in a sense to just faith-based practitioners, right. but government officials, individuals from uh, the educational sector, I like to always say uh, social workers, yeah. people who are dealing with people on a day-to-day -day basis. And what's so interesting about it today is, is that when we can kind of open up and start looking at cross-cultural communication, you talked about the Claremont Core. Mm -hmm. uh, the Claremont Core, for many who have no clue about what's going on, it's like the general ed section right. of the program. And mm -hmm. then there's the Interfaith Action Track, which is the degree program. And inside of the Claremont Core, as you mentioned, the first course is mindfulness, but you take that in tandem with mm -hmm. the first course in the Interfaith Action Program, power and privilege and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Dialogue, right. collaboration, learning how to put together a social action plan. Mm -hmm. I think those skills are extremely important today, especially for uh, those interfaith leaders working at the grassroots. Yeah, and that's exactly, I mean, where I work. So I work at a university mm -hmm. in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and right. I work at an interfaith institute there, the right. Kaufman Interfaith Institute at mm -hmm. Grand Valley State University. Right. And when I've been sharing um, my grad program, what I'm doing in my grad program with mm. others at Grand Valley, yeah. who are a part of the Masters of Social Work program, mm. a part of conversations around civil discourse and yeah. civic dialogue, civic engagement, everyone is kind of looking at that model, especially for the core, mm. moving from mindfulness to dialogue, to mm. collaboration, to change, to actually mm. doing your own project. Mm. And I think that model is exactly what the leadership skills should be modeling, right. which is how can you start inward, right. but work outward, mm -hmm. engaging across difference through dialogue, mm -hmm. how to collaborate across difference, yeah. and then how to create change. Yeah. And right now you're actually working right. on the capstone, which yes. is exciting. It's like the zenith, the peak <clears throat> of the, uh, the MA program. It's not a master's thesis, but mm -hmm. it's an actual project that you're able to carry out in collaboration with an organization. Could you kind right. of tell us a little bit about your yeah. capstone? Yeah, so my capstone is exactly on interfaith leadership skills. Oh, wow. So I am working through Grand Valley State mm -hmm. and the Kaufman Interfaith Institute right. and a grant that we have from the Grand Rapids Community Foundation mm -hmm. developing interfaith youth leaders in Grand Rapids. So there's this, um, there, we have a lot, great deal of schools, colleges mm -hmm. and universities in Grand Rapids that are primarily Christian based who don't necessarily have diverse student bodies or right. campuses, but want to learn how to engage across that difference oh, wow. because they're going to be graduating and going into diverse cities and right. businesses and right. things like that. And so um, I'm working with five student interns, mm. um, one from Aquinas College, which is a oh, Catholic yeah. Dominican mm -hmm. university, yeah, yeah, yeah. one from Calvin College, which is Christian Reformed, and then three from Grand Valley State University, which is a public secular institution. Right. So we have these interns and I'm overseeing their development as interfaith leaders. We're talking about how to voice and engage and act following mm -hmm. interfaith youth course mm -hmm. model. 
And then we're actually putting that into action, mm -hmm. doing projects on their own campuses that right. they'll be leading, right. but also coming together and doing a, a Grand Rapids, West Michigan wide right. um, interface service event that'll bridge our campuses yeah. and communities. Have you ran into any problems mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, when thinking about it, like when you are partnering with another organization, you know, they have their own expectations. Have mm -hmm. you ran into yeah. any pushback or anything like that? No, I, I wouldn't say any pushback, but it yeah. has been really interesting to watch how you know, the justification for interfaith work, for the importance of interfaith, oh, changes yeah. when you're on each campus. Right. So for Aquinas um, College, which is Catholic, mm. we really appeal to, you know, the Catholic tradition has a history of interreligious engagement yeah. and service learning. So how mm. are you going to do that? Mm. Um, the Christian Reformed Church of North America is associated mm. with Calvin College. Yeah. And while I think the CRC tradition has been supportive um, nationally of mm. interfaith dialogue, it hasn't hit locally very much in right. a lot of the local churches. Right. So it's a very new conversation for mm. them. Um, so they're really still developing, I think, why is it as Calvin College do we do this work? Um, and then Grand Valley State University, you know, we are not religiously affiliated and we're mm. unique in that way in West Michigan. Right. And so our reason for engaging with interfaith is based in the importance of diversity and inclusion and equity of all students, staff and faculty on our campus. Right. But thinking about power and privilege in self and society, which mm -hmm. is one of the courses, yeah. and then also layering that with interfaith in the 21st century, uh, have you experienced some of those power and privilege moments yeah. in interfaith uh, from time to time? Because yeah. interfaith is shifting, it's changing, it's expanding. Uh, new voices right. are uh, entering the interface sphere and entering the, the table and mm -hmm. the conversation. Have you experienced yeah. some of those challenges? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think whenever you're organizing for interfaith work, you have to be right. very conscious and intentional mm. to not let the Christian voice be the dominant voice. Yes, yes, yes. I agree. Um, I agree. Yeah, yeah, because culturally, you know, a lot of our communities, and especially in Grand Rapids, West mm. Michigan, um, the Christian community has always been the strongest voice in civic. Right and the um, civic engagement. And so how can we bring up the Muslim and Jewish and Hindu and secular voices that's it, that's it, alongside yeah. Yeah. Um, and put them all on an equal playing field? Right, right. How challenging now is it for the secular voice that's entering into yeah. the interfaith conversation? Yeah. Today? How challenging? Yeah, so um, you know, when I work on university campuses, yeah. it's not as challenging because I think right. it's a little more normalized for mm -hmm. young people to be not religious or right. non-affiliated. Spiritual, but not right. religious or what have you. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. that's a little easier mm -hmm. to engage with. Yeah. But then on the community level, mm -hmm. um, particularly older, older generations, right. I think there is a disconnect where right. Um, you know, they think that in order to be interfaith, you need mm. to declare a faith tradition right. at the door. Right. And so that leaves the secular voices outside mm. of the room, mm. which, um, you know, if we're talking about acceptance and understanding, then right. that's unacceptable. And we have right. to have everyone at the table. So it's, it's been a challenge, but mm. we work really closely with Center for Inquiry Michigan, right. um, which is an atheist, agnostic, free thinker, humanist organization. Mm. And they've been really great. We're actually hosting an event with them in a couple weeks here mm. on um, accompanying the humanist voice alongside various religious yeah. voices and why do we all work together on interfaith service projects. You know, I want to stay on this point around the secular and the humanist voice because it's extremely important, especially here. I'm seeing a number of organizations at Parliament uh, that represent, like for example, the American Humanist Association, mm -hmm. uh, Students for Secular Movements, things of that nature are present here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when opening up in really thinking about the secular humanist tradition, I find value in that conversation. Mm -hmm. At CLU, we find a lot of value in that conversation as well. That one does not have to uh, belong to a traditional religious organization or have deep ties and affiliations with a traditional religious group in order to do good in the right, world. Right. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's the tagline: putting wisdom to work in the yeah. world for good. And I find that that is extremely valuable today, but there's been a lot of pushback, you know, among uh, interfaith practitioners. And when we say interfaith at CLU, we're not just talking about theists, we're talking mm -hmm. about non-theists, we're talking about right. uh, secular humanists, our brothers and sisters from the indigenous traditions, the list goes on and on. Great wisdom traditions, all coming together and integrating their voice integrating the belief system to mm -hmm. promote social justice, to uh, uplift one another you mm -hmm. know, in the world. Moving away from the feel-good sector, yeah. but actually working together. Mm -hmm. And as it relates to humanists, secular humanists, and individuals who do not identify with religious traditions, 
I personally believe that the 21st century in moving forward, that voice will add a new type of value to the interfaith conversation. And I just want to kind of gather your thoughts yeah. on it, you know, working with the community and uh, a lot of members in the community asking questions, okay, is there a place for me mm -hmm. in yeah. this new global movement? So I think adding the humanist and secular voice mm. to our interfaith dialogues in Grand Rapids has really enriched the conversation because yeah. it's expanded us to think beyond why do you do this because of your faith tradition? Mm. But why do you do this um, as, wh where do these values come from for right, you? Right. And so I think we've kind of shifted um, the conversation from being, okay, first question, who are you and what do you identify as? Right. Instead, it's something more like, who are you? And tell us about your values yes, and where they yes, come from. Yes, yes. And so, you know, that looks differently for secular people. But, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about humanism, you know, this is the only earth we have, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And we have to make our time here in the physical world count mm -hmm. because this is what we believe in. This is right. what we believe to be true. Right. And I think that has really broadened a lot of the religious community's understanding of what it means to be secular, mm -hmm. and it's really humanized. Um, people who are not religious. Wow, wow. So where will the interfaith movement be, in your opinion, in huh. the next five to 10, 15 years? Yeah. You know, my world is really around youth. Um, yeah. So I see the youth movement for mm. interfaith work really growing. Right. I think that there are a lot of young people that really care about it because they're living in this interconnected and globalized yeah. social media world. That's Their it. campuses, our communities, we're just seeing religion and other aspects of diversity more mm. and more and not only are we noticing it more and more in our interpersonal lives right. but we see in media right. that religion is something that is a barrier for division right. a lot of right. times and i think with that spark of inspiration a lot of young people are taking that on mm. to be how can i leave my footprint and make a positive mark make a difference in this way um, yeah and i think also you know it's not even people like me who get to work for an interfaith organization right. But it's people who are going to be working in our hospitals, who are going to be teachers, um, who are in the civil society working for nonprofits. They need to have these skills to engage across difference, and particularly yep. religious, spiritual, or secular difference. Yeah. And so interfaith leaders and the interfaith movement, I think, is going to be very interdisciplinary mm. and not just confined to a church basement or anything like that, <laughs> but actually on the streets and right. in the community. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Katie. Thank you, Daryl. All right, enjoy Parliament. Thanks.